You may be seated. Isn't it an incredible feeling and experience to go to bed every night knowing that God loves you and to wake up every morning knowing that that love has not changed one little bit? It's an incredible way to live life. And uh, if that is something that you have personally not experienced in your own life, uh, my deepest desire this morning is, is that by the time this service is over, there'll come that moment for you to where you'll humbly pray and pray and ask the Lord Jesus to come live within you, to be your Savior that forgives you of your sin, to become your hope for every day in which you live, and to be the reality of your destiny, that death holds no fear for you because heaven will be your just reward. And all of that because of Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of theology in that one line in this song that you might miss. We're alive because you're alive. See, Tim wasn't singing that he's alive because y'all are alive. We were singing together that we're alive because you, the Lord Jesus, is alive. It is because of his sacrificial life, his sacrificial death, his willingness to be buried in a tomb and confined for three days only to break out and to give us the freedom from all of our sin and its consequences through the resurrection that we can be alive as he is alive. Because he lives, we live also. Born physically alive but dead in our trespasses and sins. And through Jesus Christ, we can have new birth, a new life and a new walk with him. Physical life and spiritual life. And when we have both, there's no stopping us. There is no stopping us. Well, there was absolutely no charge for that extra sermon today. Um, this song kind of got my fires going. If you were asleep coming in here, you're bound to be awake by now, all right? That song will do it for you. Thanks for being at New Hope today. You bless us. You honor us with your presence as our church family. We need it with each other. This is our time to be encouraged. This is our time uh, uh, to be strengthened. Uh, this is our time to, to encourage somebody else in our fellowship who's had a, a really tough or challenging week. And if you are a guest today, you honor us by, uh, by checking us out, by, by checking the Lord Jesus out. And uh, we hope that we do honor to who he is. Uh, we would love to know of your presence today, not because we want to come knock on your door. We will not do that. Uh, we're not going to pester you on the telephone, but we would love to know of your presence here. There's a card in the pew in front of you. It's a communication card. Love for you to fill it out. Drop it in the offering bag next week through the mail, all right, through snail mail. We are going to send you information about the church, what we believe, who our staff is, services that are available, and we would love to get that information in your hand. Those cards are also for our church family to get messages to our staff about prayer requests, appointments, uh, updates on your uh, address or emails. So please take advantage of those cards and drop them in the offering as they come by in a little while. We're going to spend a couple of minutes just uh, highlighting a few special events coming up, a few prayer requests, and then we'll get re-engaged in our worship today. Uh, we are at day 14 of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you're new, uh, uh, we started 14 days ago with churches all over the cities of Fresno and Clovis. Uh, Praying and fasting, fasting, all different kinds of fasts. Some it's a physical fast, uh, some it's an emotional fast, uh, some it's a thing fast, all right? Uh, some are fasting from food, all right? Certain kinds of food. Uh, some are going on a limited diet. Others are fasting from TV, from Facebook. Uh, people have their own opportunity. It's not too late if you want to join us for the last week. And, and the whole purpose is for our focus uh, during the period of time that we would have been doing those other things to focus our attention on our relationship with Jesus Christ and to pray for the unity in the body of Christ in the cities of Fresno and Clovis so that God's kingdom can make a difference in the cities in which we live in. And to enhance that idea of unity amongst our churches, there have been services scheduled every night for the last 14 days and will continue until next Sunday night. Uh, and, and it's just been terrific. Um, I gotta be honest, it's been a little tough at times, all right? To, to man, you, so you finish your day and, and grab a quick bite sometimes and then run off to service at, at, uh, at seven o'clock. Um, some of the services this past week, let's see, last night we were at Calvary Temple. That is a, a Hispanic church, bilingual church, what used to be the old Cedar Avenue Baptist Church between Belmont and Olive. And uh, terrific time there last night. I've been in the House of Miracle Faith on Merced Avenue off of uh, 
uh, Kearney Boulevard. Uh, what a sweet time, what a sweet time we had, uh, predominantly an a- African-American church. Um, they still, in many, of, in many of the African-American churches, uh, the principal instrument is an organ, okay? And it never stops. It plays the whole service. It plays during the prayer, it plays during the pre- preaching, it plays during, you know, it plays during the music. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's so cool. It was so cool. It was fun. Um, we were then in um, um, missionary, Zion Missionary Baptist Church, just a few blocks away from that one on another night. They're, they're, they're a little quiet. And, and you got to understand, these two buildings, they can't hardly hold 100 people. And there were about 120 of us both nights from all over. There, was, there, 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 were, there were Asians and Hispanics. And, of course, the black community was well represented. Uh, the white birds from Clovis were there. Uh, we, we all, all, and it was just incredible. And their little choir, they had them from five years old to 93 years old in their choir that led us in worship. And it was just, it was just this way. I have friends now because they've been going every night. I think I've only missed three nights so far. And uh, we now look for each other, all right, because we know that in about seven or eight more days, we're probably not going to see each other for a while. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how we can do that. But it's, it's been a great time. Uh, tonight, there's a service at uh, the First Presbyterian Church in downtown Fresno, Calaveras and M Street. And uh, the weekend services are from five to six, okay? Five to six, the week, weeknight services are from seven to eight. And they've been very, very conscientious. Uh, it's, it's, it's at an hour. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> as you know, the um, uh, black community churches, they're not much on time. Okay, their preachers, if they don't preach an hour, it's, it's a short sermon, all right? So they don't have an ending time. But since they're kind of strict on this, I've noticed in every church that we've been in on the west side, they start about 10 minutes early. <laughs> okay, we've got to let you out on this. So we're going to get a little fudge. We're going to start just a little bit early and get things going. But it's just been, it, it has been terrific. We've had representatives from New Hope at every single service, and that has been cool. So tonight at First Press, uh, tomorrow night at a little church called uh, Fresno Deliverance Church. And, and we've been from uh, Baptists, uh, 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 Methodists, uh, Independents, um, charismatic, not charismatic. It's been a, uh, tomorrow night's going to be charismatic. Fresno Deliverance Church. The pastor there, sweet guy. He was with us last Saturday night when, when we had it here at New Hope. Um, uh, he is a, get this, he is a missionary from Nigeria to the United States. Coming to bring the gospel, all right, to a community in, in downtown Fresno. And uh, just a sweet, sweet man. His name is Pastor Israel. So uh, anyway, I hope you've been getting the emails every morning as we do a, a little shout out about what's going on and a quick devotional thought for the day. Uh, and then next Sunday night, next Sunday evening, uh, there's going to be the concluding service designed for everybody who possibly can to come. And that's going to be held at Cornerstone, the old Wilson Theater in downtown Fresno. And that will be at five o'clock. Uh, tonight, Six o'clock service here. Uh, They are coinciding with our Sunday morning and our small group Bible study. And we are looking at the subject, all the places to go. Open doors and closed doors. How do we tell the difference? And they even actually have a door on the stage for Sunday night service. All right. So you got to come check the door out tonight. All right. Uh, And so they'd love to have you back here at six o'clock tonight. Uh, And I hope you're enjoying your small group study. We certainly are. We've got about 44 from our church that are up at Hume Lake this weekend. Uh, 37 high school and junior high students went up for winter camp, left here Friday afternoon, and we've got about seven adult sponsors up there with them. And so be praying for them. Uh, It snowed on them Friday night, so they got a little snow up there, and uh, they'll be back later this afternoon. So uh, we trust for their safety as they travel. Deacons are highlighting two areas of their ministry out under the pavilion today. Hope you'll stop by and check them out. Uh, Go see Judy at the coffee cart, and uh, she's looking for a few folks who uh, on occasions could help assist in the coffee cart ministry between our services. So uh, if you you are a wannabe barista, 
There's your chance. All right, go see Judy today. Uh, also at the table, you're going to find a couple of guys. I think Roger and Mark are out there. They're with our safety and posse team. That's the guys who are out there in the bright yellow jackets, kind of trying to keep chaos from setting in in our parking lot, uh, particularly between this service and the next. And also to make sure that uh, our parking lot is as, as uh, safe as it can be. And uh, we haven't had very many break-ins over the years, but on occasions we've had a few. So we try to reduce that. If you would like to be of help, uh, every once in a while out there, stop and see Roger and Mark. The more hands we have, the less frequently people have to do that. Widow's Lunch Bunch is meeting today, and that information is in the bulletin. Uh, let's see here. There's going to be an elder board class offered on February 4th about what the Bible says about being an elder in a church is. If uh, you, that has any interest to you, please show up on February the 4th at 1045 over in our office um, meeting room. Uh, you have the names of the eight people from New Hope Church that will be leaving for the Ivory Coast of Africa uh, on February the 3rd. And so I hope you put that someplace where you can begin to pray for all of us. Uh, we have final prep. Start praying now. We have final preparations before we leave. And uh, then pray for us while we were gone. Be going to Duropo, Ivory Coast, for the medical mission part of it. And then on to the village of Neonan, the village we have adopted. Uh, and they now have a village inside their village that they call New Hope Village. Uh, and that's because of all the help that you all have been to them in seeing that their children get an education where an education was not possible before. Please mark February uh, the 18th, that Sunday evening, uh, for a special time here on a Sunday night service with His Little Feet. A group of 17 or 18 children from Asia and Africa and South America who were abandoned and orphaned and abused. And they have been given a second chance at life through Jesus Christ and this ministry through Compassion International called His Little Feet. And they will come and knock your socks off with how they sing. Uh, I had a chance to hear them last Wednesday night at one of our evening events. And they are absolutely terrific. And there's some wonderful testimonies that comes along with their music. So you'll want to be with us that particular night. And if you would be willing to host a couple of children and a sponsor in your home, we sent the sign-up sheet around last time. I don't have it in here today, but you can contact uh, Mark Addis and he'll follow up with you on the necessary information. Uh, prayer requests. Um, I want you to remember Lorraine Keene. She's in the hospital today. She is the mother of one of the ladies who is a regular attender in our 8 o'clock service. And uh, she is probably going under hospice care, uh, maybe even today. So would appreciate you remembering to pray for Lorraine Keene. Uh, yesterday we had two memorial services here uh, for Lori Lyle and or Leslie and Doug Eaton. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to our, to, to our church family. You all have been great. We have been inundated with memorial service since the holidays, and you guys have just stepped to the plate again and again and again. What a great team was here yesterday. Set up, serve, tear down, get things ready for today. Food that you've brought, you've done great. There's another one here tomorrow, and there's another one on Friday. And so I just want to say thank. We appreciate, again, many volunteers make light work, and you have made, you have made a difference. In fact, um, just, just a side note, and there's a family here today that, that told me when I introduced myself to them, they're here because they attended a funeral here uh, a few months back. And that day made a difference. So it does. It does make a difference. And I want to say thank you for all of your help in that area. So please just remember the names which are on here uh, for God's care and comfort in the recent uh, changes in their life because of loss. Uh, also continue to pray for those who are sick and are going through cancer treatment. We would appreciate that so very, very much. That wraps that up. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us today as we have our Morning tithes and offering, um, and then we're going to get engaged in our worship today. Um, I want you to notice we have, uh, we have new offering bags, all right? They're ugly, um, but <laughs> we were getting complaints about our other ones that they were kind of ratty, you know, and kind of falling apart. And so, but this was the only color in stock, um, so don't hold that against us, all right? And don't hold out from God because of how the offering bag looks. Um, I'm sure some think it's pretty. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, well, hey, it was all we had to choose from. It was the only choice, all right? Um, anyway, thank you so very much for your kindness and your generosity. Let's pray.
Father, I love you. I am exceedingly grateful. I'm exceedingly grateful for your care, your compassion, and your love for us. I'm grateful for your patience. That in spite sometimes of how much we know the scriptures, we sometimes, um, we launch off into our own directions. Though we've learned sometimes to walk in the Spirit, our flesh rises up and takes control. And Father, you are so gracious with us at those moments that happen. You whisper in our ear. You sometimes shout in our heart, hey, hey, hey. You don't want to keep going that direction. It's the reason Paul wrote that incredible, what sometimes mysterious passage where he said, I am crucified with Christ so that it's not I who lives today, but it's Christ who lives in me. Father, sometimes we have a habit of crawling off the cross and taking charge of our own affairs again. And you give us gentle and sometimes not so gentle reminders. Hey, it's better if you stay on the cross and let me do it through you. Thank you for those reminders this week. Father, thank you for your care and provision in meeting needs of so many people in our fellowship. And thank you for using new hope, Father, and in, in, in a useful way to meet needs of others. I trust that you will always find us ready, willing, and available for the open doors that you provide for us to let you express your love to others in times of difficulty, challenge, and need. Thank you for the, the generosity of so many folks of their time and their energy and their effort to be used by you in small and big ways. Thank you for what you want to teach us today, Lord. Thank you for what you've been doing in our midst. May we continue to give you great freedom so that you can do all that you choose to do today. Father, I pray for the message that what you have worked into the fabric of my mind and my heart, that it's all of you, that I'm simply your lips today conveying your truth. I pray that Tim Rowland stays completely out of the picture and that what we hear is your voice in our hearts. We commit this and our giving to you in the incredible name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I invite you to find the book of Revelation, if you would. Uh, if anybody ask, ever asks you to find the book of Revelations, tell them you don't know how to find it. Um, there is not a book in the Bible called Revelations. The last book of the Bible, it's very easy to find. There's no S on the end. It was the singular Revelation of God to John the Apostle as he had a message to the seven churches and then to the rest of the world. And we'll find that in the book of Revelation. And today we're going to look at, at one of the messages that God had for one of the churches. And uh, ever since the book of Revelation has been in the hands of the church, the message to each of those churches is also the message to all the church. So as we telescope, or I should say microscope in, on one of those churches today, we have to understand what he said then he wants to say to us today. So I'm going to give you a little time to find the book of Revelation chapter 3. Just before we jump into the message, uh, there are two gems in the service today, in this service, that I want to acknowledge. We have a gem sitting up here on the front row. His last name is Lindbergh. Yeah, he's waving his cane. Um... <laughs> That's better than what he does with that cane towards Jane sometimes, I understand. But anyway, uh, no, no, he never does that. Uh, Jim will turn 89 tomorrow. That's awesome. That's great. And then sitting towards the back on the opposite side, we have another Jim. His name is Jim Boren. He is not going to be 89 tomorrow. But last Friday was his last day as the editor-in-chief of the Fresno Bee. He has retired. Jim, how many years of service? How many? 48? 48 years at the Fresno Bee, all right? Retired. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, the fact is, though, he retired from the Bee last Friday... And he started to work at Fresno State University on Wednesday last week. 
not much retirement going on there yet, all right? But uh, we're so excited for the new, uh, the new season in Jim Boren's life. And uh, we're also blessed to have called him friend for a lot of years. It's been our joy. Uh, follow along with me, if you will, as we read Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 7. I mean, 3, sorry. Thank you, guys. Thanks for correcting me. Chapter 3, 2 Jims, Revelation 3. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia. You know what? It just dawned on me. One of the sweet things I've learned in our, um, in a, in, in that, that song was great. You taught us today, by the way. I loved it. And it fits what we're doing in our 21 days. Tearing down walls, all right? Denominational walls, worship style walls, cultural barriers. It's been great. Uh, but one of the sweet things that I've, 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 I've enjoyed in some of the services is in, 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 uh, in, in do, do I get in trouble? Do I, do I have to say African-American or black? Which one do I say? <laughs> you want to be politically no, I want to be okay with your culture. Way. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, one of the sweet things is they, ref, they, 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 when they, they talk to the, about the pastors as being the angel of the church. And they pray for us. And they got us all up in, the, the, in, in Pastor Binion Church. They got all of us pastors up. And, 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 and they pray, God bless these angels of the church. And every, every, every church we've been in like that, we're praying for that angel. And so I, I don't know that I've ever thought that y'all thought I was an angel before. All right? But... <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Shelly said we don't. All right, yeah. Uh, that's payback for the, uh, for the offering bags, all right? Um, but it just dawned on me reading this. This is probably where they get it from, all right, right here, because each of these letters to the seven churches written to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. Let me pause right there. That first line of verse 8. I don't know if that one unnerves you a little bit. It does me every time I read it. I'm, if, if, if we're Christian, we've been in church very long at all, all of us know that God is omniscient, right? That's a big theological term, which simply means God is everywhere, all right? The, the, the three key things about God, he's omniscient, omnipotent, okay, and omnipresent, okay? So omnipresent, he is everywhere, okay? Omnipotent, he is all-powerful, omniscient, he knows all things. There's nothing, we, we know, but, but see, it's one thing to know something intellectually and theologically, it's another thing to experience it personally. So in this conversation between the Lord Jesus and the church, He's saying, I know your deeds. I know it all. Remember how you felt when you were a teenager and your dad looked at you and said, I know what you've been up to? And then you poured your guts out and you told him far more than he knew. <laughs> all right, all right. That, that, that's a parent trick. Okay, I'm not telling you that that's a parent trick, all right? Um, but see, with God, it's not a trick. He does know. He does know. And, and realizing that, it should bring us to a point of confession in that prayer. Okay, Lord, you're right. I, I need to remember that. So, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. It doesn't sound like much of a compliment, does it? I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, kind of reading between the lines, they've been experiencing trouble. They have endured trouble patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial or I will keep you through the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world 
to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And may God bless and bring clarity to us in the reading of a scripture. There's a story about a guy who happened to be visiting a friend who took him to a, an old one-room church building in the backwoods of Arkansas. This guy did not realize what kind of church it was he was attending until the minister started pulling rattlesnakes out of a burlap bag. Any of you know what I'm talking about? All right, yeah, uh, it used to be relatively common practice in that part of the country 45, 50, 60 years ago. It does still go on. In fact, uh, um, uh, surfing through some TV channels several months ago, there's one of the channels, I guess, that now there's a program of these guys, all right? Um, and and, and what, it, what it's all about for them is, is they are proving their faith that God, the greater your faith is, the more rattlesnakes you'll hold. I'm not sure that that's, evidence of your faith. I think it might be more an indication of your lunacy, all right, at that moment. Um, uh, God's given us good common sense, all right. Uh, but anyway, it, it, it is a practice that is done. And so this guy was taken to a church, didn't know that's what he was doing, and the, the pastor standing at the front handing rattlesnakes, you know, down each aisle. Um, this guy was not interested in handling a rattlesnake. He frantically began turning one way and the other in the church looking for the back door he realized that all he could find was one door, and it was the door that he had come in, and between him and that door was the pastor with the burlap bag and the rattlesnakes. And he turned to his friend, and he says, where's your back door? And the friend says, we ain't got one. And he said, well, tell me where you'd like one. <laughs> he was about to create for them a back door. Um, in our passage today, we find Jesus telling the church at Philadelphia, and by the way, guys, this is not in Pennsylvania, just, just so you know, this church of Philadelphia here. Um, and, and, and Jesus told the church of Philadelphia, I'm willing to open up a whole new door for you. We want to figure out what's that all about today. There are um, three things I want to pull out of this passage and then a final personal observation I, I want to make that I think is applicable to us today. The, the first thing I want us to look at is, first of all, Jesus has always desired to open doors for his people. Jesus has always had the desire in his heart to open doors for his people. Um, Jesus opened up the Garden of Eden in creation for Adam and Eve. Jesus opened up the door for renewal of a relationship with Adam and Eve after they messed up. Jesus opened the door for Israel to become the people of God in the world through Abraham, a couple who had no children and were old. And he opened a door late in their life to become the father of a great nation. God opened a Red Sea so the children of Israel could leave captivity and head to the promised land. And he opened the Jordan River so they could, could enjoy the milk and honey that God had in store for them. God, God has been in the open door business. He, he opened a, a hot furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so they could walk out of it and reflect to the rest of the world God provides. God, of course, the classic open door is the rolling away of a stone in front of a tomb to reveal that it was empty, that the resurrection was real. God loves to open doors for his people. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus declared, I am the door. 
If anyone enters in by me, they will be saved. And they can go in and out and find pasture with me. Jesus is himself an open door. He is the way in which he offers to us salvation. In Revelation chapter 3, the same chapter we just read from, but later uh, uh, another letter takes place after the one to Philadelphia, the church of Laodicea. And, and, and in there, there's a, a, a famous verse that we often use uh, in, in sharing our faith with Jesus Christ with others. It's often used as a salvation passage, and yet that was not its original intent. Jesus said these words, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Verse 20. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will have fellowship with him and and, and they with me. Understand, church, that this is actually kind of a sad picture. See, Jesus said, I am the open door so that you can have eternal life. And verse 20, chapter 3, book of Revelation was written to the church. You could just as well put the name New Hope Church there. Believers. And Jesus said, the door that you entered through me for salvation, you have now closed the door and I'm standing at the door. I'm wanting to have continual, ongoing fellowship, relationship with you. I don't ever want there to be a break in this relationship that you and I have. But, but, but God is a perfect gentleman. He could storm the door, but he doesn't. He says, I'm knocking. I'd like back in the house. I'd like to have access to all that you are because everything that I am, I have available to you for all that you are. Would you open the door? I I swung the door open wide so you could come to me, but now you've, you've, you've locked yourself in a room. We've thrown a temper tantrum with God and we've closed him out of where we are. So, There's a door that leads to salvation. There is a a door that needs to be opened for intimacy. But the door in Revelation 3.8 appears to be slightly different from these other two. This isn't a door that's opened to Jesus so that we can get to him for salvation. And this isn't a door opened for Jesus so that we can have intimacy with him. But this is a door opened by Jesus for a faithful church. This is a door of opportunity. This is a door of influence. This is a door of timely ministry that God wants to bless in and through his church. I think there'll be something personal for us to pull out of this in just a moment. But I want you to see this is a letter to a church about that church. And God says, I am going to open this door. The second thing I want us to notice out of this passage is Jesus tells us he's going to open a door for them because of their faith. You see, and I, you and I might not have liked that little sentence in there. We might not have liked the idea that he pointed out to them that they have little strength. It's not a lot. It's a little. And yet that is how God chooses to open doors. Because of that little faith, they had kept Jesus' word. He indicated that in the passage, all right? Yet, you have kept my word, and you have not denied me during times of difficulty, but you have endured patiently. Jesus, please notice something. Jesus isn't telling them that they are going to have this open door for a dynamic ministry because they had powerful programs that were working in their church. He didn't tell them, I'm going to do this because you've got a a forceful, influential preacher in the pulpit. He didn't tell them that we're doing this because you have built a beautiful edifice that you call a church. He's telling them that he's going to entrust to them an open door of opportunity because they were faithful with a little strength. You see, faithfulness to Jesus, this is not physical power because that is not the source of a truly dynamic church. In fact, had you looked at this church in Philadelphia, you probably would not have been very impressed with them at all. Jesus tells them, I know you have a little strength. Quite frankly, folks, this church probably had no programs, 
and it probably didn't even have a full-time pastor, and it certainly did not have a beautiful church building. They met in homes. They didn't have a Sunday. Sunday school had not been invented yet. Kids Fest, Vacation Bible School didn't exist. I doubt if they had a youth pastor or a seniors pastor. They had, they had deacons probably to minister to the needs of those in their fellowship. They got together for the purpose of breaking bread, fellowship, studying God's word, growing from a little strength, hopefully to a mature believer. That was the church. The third thing I want us to notice is we'll see how God does things, not how man does things. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. He said, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose a guy by the name of Gideon to help the nation of Israel out of a huge conflict. And Gideon said, God, what are you coming to me for? I'm the youngest in my family. My family is the poorest of the tribe that we're in. I'm about the bottom of the barrel. God said, you're my man. Gideon said, okay. And when the call went out, hundreds of thousands of men stepped out to volunteer. Gideon said, okay, this will be cool. I got a big army. And God said, "Uh uh-uh. Half of them got to go back right now. And he gave them a couple of other tests. By the time the tests were finished, do you you remember how many Gideon had left? From over hundreds of thousands, he was left with 300. Here's the youngest guy in the family, in the poorest family in the tribe, in the weakest tribe in the nation, and God gives him 300 soldiers. And then he takes away his spear and his bow and his arrows and he gives them a pitcher and a lamp. And he said, go win a war. God takes the weak things and the foolish things. You remember the story of Esther? Little book in the Old Testament? Read it. She was a beauty queen. She was a pageant winner. God used her to save a nation. God used... uh, Please do not tell any beauty pageant contestant what I just said. God takes the most ordinary, unlikely candidates... And he's willing to use us. Don't don't misunderstand me. If you have a great personality, he wants to use you too. Don't don't misunderstand me. If you have great power, he'd love to use you. But until you discover that you are nothing in him, you are not usable to him. That's the challenge. You see, those who have very little are aware that we have very little. And we have no other option but to trust him. That's why the statement Jesus made It's more difficult for a rich man to enter into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that's a whole other lengthy explanation of what that means. It it sounds really weird, but it makes perfect sense in the culture. And all Jesus was saying is when when, when when you have a lot of wealth, you tend to put your trust in your wealth and you do not trust God as much anymore. Um, it was interesting. I read a story this week um, about a guy who, who, who gave two different, ser- two, two different testimonies. One, when he was earning minimum wage, he was talking about how God had blessed his life because he had been honoring God with his tithe. And he said, God has been meeting my needs. Five years later, this guy who was making minimum wage ended up starting a business, and he'd become a multimillionaire. And the pastor went to him and said, you remember that testimony you gave in church about that? He said, I don't see you give anymore. 
And he looked at him and he said, Pastor, do you realize how much that would be if I tithe on what I earn now? See, we, we, we often put our sufficiency in what we've been able to do. God can take the rich man. God can take the successful person. God can take the brilliant and he can use them. But we have to admit that apart from him, we are nothing. And give him the freedom to do in us what he wants to do. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you and I are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom from God. He is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Um, do any of you ever just go to, and I know it's different now. So, sorry, sorry, Jim. Um, I know it's different now with newspapers than it used to be. I mean, used to every day we got one at the house. We paid, uh, but, and one of the, one of the things that, that I always looked at, I mean, standard folks, you would read the sports page. You would read the obituaries to make sure your name wasn't there. Um, and, 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 and then I don't know about you, but one of the things I did was, oh, and we'd scan the headlines to see if there's anything of interest that we wanted to delve into. But one of the things I would do for fun is I would always read the want ads. I would see what was in there, all right? Well, I have a new thing that I do for fun on occasions is I go to the preacher want ads, you guys may not even know there's such a thing, but, but, but there is. There is. But because of the computer age, one ads have changed now. There's all kinds of bulletin boards out there. You can type in whatever you're looking for, and you can come up with it. Well, the, the same thing exists now for people in ministry. Used to, you got hired because of the denomination you were in, or because of the church you grew up in, uh, or a Bible college you had connection to. But now that there, a lot of those walls have come down, it's far more open, but at times it's challenging to find somebody to fill staff positions in churches. And so you can go to various places online and their bulletin boards. For example, Youth Specialties. That is uh, an organization been around for about, I think, 35 years probably. They started teaching cutting-edge strategies to youth pastors so that they could stay current with the times, all right? And, and, and it's really, really good. Well, what you can do now, if you're looking for a youth pastor, you can go to Youth Specialties page, pull down the menu. Up there, uh, youth pastors looking for work, you can click on that. Or there's another drop-down on that, uh, 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 Church is looking for youth pastors. So you can go out it both ways. Youth pastors looking for a church. Church looking for a youth pastor. And that also exists for every position in the church. And so every now and then, just for the heck of it, I like to go and see what churches are looking for. It's a lot of fun. I also find it somewhat amusing. I chuckle frequently. Often, I will run across an ad that sounds like this. Churches of 50 people or 75 people desire hardworking, Bible-based preacher that's highly motivated to make a church grow. I think it kind of sounds like to me a couple of things. Number one, that maybe their past has been a pastor who doesn't like to work hard, who is not Bible-based, and who has no desire to see a church grow. I mean, quite frankly, what they're asking for is what every pastor wants to do, all right? So it's kind of, to me, it's a, a rather foolish kind of thing. And with all due respect to those churches, um, I think it displays an unfortunate attitude. See, see what I, the, the sense I get is what they're saying is we're only going to grow if we have the right preacher, the right preacher will simply pull us together as a church. It is by the personality of the preacher. It is by his faithfulness to the word. It is by his prayer life. It is by his commitment to the church. You see, for them, the preacher becomes the magic bullet that will turn that church into a dynamic force that will open the doors for that congregation. And oh, if that is the attitude that seems to be portrayed, at least in my thinking, what a sad day it is for them. Churches ought not to be built on any personality. There's no magic bullet. There is nothing said to this church at Philadelphia about how good the pastor is. And yet God says, I will give to them an open door. This is not about one person who leads the church. This is about the body of Christ, the church in a local congregation setting, being led by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
God rebuked his people in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1, when he said, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in chariots, and in the great strength of their horsemen. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek his strength for help. You see, where we need to look to for whatever the growth and health level of the church that God wants us to be is to him That's the same shameful attitude Israel had that undermines countless of churches around the world. Their eyes aren't on the Holy One of Israel, but the mighty man from Bible college who might rescue them from where they are. I'd be a lot more impressed by a church who would put a one ad something like this. Church of 50 people looking for a biblically sound preacher who won't get in the way. A man who will encourage us to pray, who will teach us how to share our faith. A man who will preach prepared sermons from the pulpit, but won't feel that it's his personal responsibility to do everything else. We want a preacher who will enable us to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That sounds like a good church, doesn't it? It's one I might want to go to. I think it's the kind of church I have the privilege of being a part of. You see, Jesus opened doors Because that's the kind of church the Savior looks for. And the Savior says to us, where do you want the door? He's ready to open it up for us so we can walk through it. One pastor remembered a church he saw when he was a boy. It was a small church out in the middle of nowhere. It was not particularly impressive. But what was memorable about that church were the two big wooden doors that were the entrance of the building. Someone had screwed into the doors two large metal plates, and they had large metal bars as handles welded to them. And through these bars was a heavy chain and a padlock. Now, that alone would have been enough to have remembered the building. But what really got this guy's attention was the name of the church over the door of the church. The Open Door Baptist Church. (laughs) With a chain and a padlock on. How sad. We've had discussions here on numerous occasions, well, not numerous, on some occasions, when we've had break-ins to buildings or break-ins to cars. Over 25 years I've been here, it's happened maybe six times. And we've had conversations, should we, should we block off our parking lot? And the answer is no. I feel bad every time I drive by a church and I see gates closed. Is there any place it needs to? I, I, quite frankly, I wish we could leave the front door unlocked. Because we're not to be a closed off place to the world. And I don't want to do anything that seems to signify. I'd rather put up with some little inconveniences than portray an image we are a closed off place. Jesus tells the church at Philadelphia they're responsible enough to be trusted with an open door. They've been faithful in tough times, though they may have very little strength. Jesus in Luke chapter 16, verse 10 said, Whoever can be trusted with a little can now be trusted with much. And the church of Philadelphia had little strength. From some, we might even say weak. But it was enough strength on the basis of faith to still obey God's word in the midst of hard times. All we have to do to be honored by Christ with a healthy ministry here is to be faithful with what he has entrusted to us. I would suggest to you that faith is the key that opens doors and fear is the factor that closes doors. We are inwardly fashioned for faith, not fear. Fear is not our native land. Faith is. i got to wrap this up pretty quickly. But um, how did Adam and Eve walk around the garden for the first significant period of time that they were created? How did they walk around? Naked. That's right, buck naked. Okay, not a stitch on. How else did they walk around? In fellowship with the Lord. Access to everything that was there. One little tree in the middle. Tree of choice. Everything, everything else was there. There's one little thing. God said, this is your place of choice. Are you going to be selfless or selfish? You're going to be led by me. You're going to be led by your own, own desires. Which one? One tree of choice. Everything. So they could walk freely. They walked without fear 
even amongst all of the animal creation that was there, no fear. They weren't afraid of the dark. They weren't afraid of the animals. They weren't afraid of burglars. No fear. One day then they, they stepped into independence from God and they ate. What changed in their walking around the garden? What did they do even before Jesus called their name? What did they do? They hid. Faith replaced by fear. The open door and free access, boom, closed. Faith or fear? God designed us for faith. To live by worry is not to live in the reality that God has for us. Let me wrap this up. The, my, my last observation. We must believe that God is placing before, I believe that God is placing before new hope right now in this season of our time, a, a, an open door. Ever since our indescribable service last year, if you were here, you know what I'm talking about. If you weren't, we'll explain it later. But we had a very unusual service on a particular Sunday morning. And there seems to be this fresh breeze of God's activity blowing through our fellowship. Tim Kepler's been talking about it ever since that Sunday. God has been laying upon his heart that he's prepared to do here. Baptisms just, 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 just you know, in the last two weeks is an indication of what God is up to. Our worship has been dynamic. December closed as a record-giving month of generosity. But, but here's what we must be careful of, folks. We must be very careful not to take credit for what God is choosing to do. We must say, God, this is all about you. Do what you want to in me. We must not try to manage what God is orchestrating. We must give him the freedom to do what he's up to. We must not believe that because God is doing this, we must not believe that because God is doing this, because we have little faith, that we don't need to grow in our faith. Did you get that? I might need to say it again so it makes sense. You see, we could say, oh, I have to have little faith so that God opens doors. No, no, that's not what God said here. There was enough faith for him to open a door, but that should not leave us content at little faith. We need to choose to grow. This is not a time for us to be tentative with God. We need to grow. We need to let him build up our faith even more. So, so what should we do then? I think we need to thank God consistently for his presence, his activity, and his favor in our fellowship. We need to humbly acknowledge that this is his activity through us, and we surrender all that we are for him to use we need to grow in faith and faithfulness. We need to let the preeminence of his presence be at work in our person. Let me say that again because it's a really good line. We need to let the preeminence of his presence be at work in our person. We grow through Bible study to know him better. We grow in worship to admire him more. We grow in fellowship with his family so we can love each other deeper. We grow in giving to God ourselves, our resources, our time, so we will be more selfless and less selfish. We grow in a desire to have more influence in reaching others for Christ. We grow in our desire to go and share Christ and make disciples. With this, I am closing. You see, it's when we allow ourselves to be used by God that our small strength can accomplish great things. The story is told of a mother who wanted to encourage her young son in his piano lessons. So she took him to a concert hall to hear the master Paderewski in concert. After they were seated, the mother spotted a friend in the audience. She walked down the aisle to go visit for a moment. The boy, a very curious youngster, was impressed by the beauty of the hall. He got up, and he decided to explore a little. And he went through a door, said no admittance. <laughs> he thought it was an open door. And it was. When the house lights dimmed and the concert was about to begin, the mother returned to her seat to discover her son was missing. Suddenly the curtains parted, the spotlights focused on the impressive Steinway on the stage, and in horror the mother saw her little boy sitting on the piano stool, playing twinkle, twinkle, little star. At that, I'm going to go into music ministry in my next career. Um, at that moment, the great piano maestro saw what was going on, and before the crowd got uneasy, he walked out, put his arms around the little boy, and whispered in his ear, don't quit, keep playing, don't quit, keep playing. And then leaning over, Paderewski reached down with his left hand and began to fill in the bass part. And then soon with his right arm, he reached around the other side, and he added a counter melody to what the boy was playing. And together, the old master and the young boy transformed a potentially disastrous situation into a wonderful creative experience. And when they had finished playing, the audience broke out and Applause this morning. 
God wants to put his arms around you and me who has little strength and he wants to add beautiful music. But you know what he'd like most? God longs for the day in when he can do through us what he has been doing for us. Are you ready for that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life you share with us. We take so much for granted. You take little things and you make them much. You take a small boy's lunch and you feed a multitude. And you have a take-home bag for everybody to go home with. I pray that there'll be more little boys in this, in this audience, this congregation, this fellowship, who will let you use our life the way in he, which he let Jesus use his lunch. I don't know how that looks for each of us, but I know you would love to do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon, guys.